Welcome to Sacred Justice, a podcast that features discourse rooted in the pursuit of justice as sacred practice. Our weekly discussions reflect on current events, art, media, theology, and how they intersect with the movements for freedom and liberation. We hope that through these conversations, we can foster inclusivity by expanding our learning opportunities. We hope to cultivate digital community beyond the confines of our campus. And we hope to reconnect the church's social and spiritual callings. Join us for the journey. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Sacred Justice, our weekly podcast here at Myers Park Baptist Church. We are back from our end of summer hiatus, and I do hope you've gotten a chance to listen to the first 15 episodes of this new spiritual growth endeavor that we rolled out this year. Um, We really do believe that the podcast is an excellent way for you to enhance your sacred journey. And so please do go back and listen to some of the first 15 episodes. Tell us what you think and also suggest some new topics. We would love to hear from you as we continue this faith formation endeavor. Last month, we were honored to host our annual Pride Month series. We do this every August. It is Pride Month in Charlotte in August, not June. And so we had a number of special guests from Bethany Corrigan, who is the executive director of Transcend Charlotte. Uh, which cares for our transgender and gender expansive community here in Charlotte. And we also had James Admins, a theologian and seminary graduate who focuses on queer and transgender theologies. And then we closed out with Reverend Tara Gibbs and we talked all about sex and sexuality. So please go listen to that four part conversation series as we head into the fall. Today, we are chatting with the Reverend Will Gaffney, the Reverend Doctor. Um, Our uh, 2021 Faith in the 21st Century Scholar, and I'm so excited to have Dr. Gaffney on the podcast. I'm going to just read a little bit of uh, the bio that we have put into our advertisements for those of you who have been following The Reverend Will Gaffney, PhD, is the Wright Reverend Samuel B. uh, Hosey Professor of Hebrew Bible at Wright Divinity School in Fort Worth, Texas. She is the author of Womanist Midrash, A Reintroduction to Women of the Torah and the Throne, a commentary on Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah, Daughters of Miriam, Women Prophets in Ancient Israel, And some of the latest publications that I got on my desk, a women's lectionary for the whole church. And I have year W here and year A here. And I'm looking forward to talking more about that in this particular conversation. She is an Episcopal priest, uh, canonically resident in the Diocese of Pennsylvania and licensed in the Diocese of Fort Worth and a former army chaplain and congregational pastor in the AME Zion Church, that is African Methodist Episcopal, for those of you who may not be familiar. Um, Dr. Gaffney, we are so excited to have you as our Faith in the 21st Century speaker this year. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be with you. Yes. Is there anything else you want to say about yourself? That was just a snippet of the introduction, but I would love to hear more uh, from you about some things that you have been doing, maybe your work at the seminary and beyond. Well, we are just returning to in-person classes for some of us, uh, some who choose, some who have smaller classes, uh, those of us who are vaccinated, there are a number of metrics. Uh, This semester I'm teaching Hebrew, which is one of my favorite things to do, and I only get to do it about every five years with the rotation. Um, As you noted, I did just release the first two volumes of what will be a four-volume lectionary set, a traditional three-year, years A, B, and C, and year W, which is a standalone volume. Uh, I'm also working on the next installment of Womanist Midrash. This will focus on women in the prophetic texts in the Hebrew Bible. 
So that's what I'm up to these days. Oh, good. I'm, I'm excited for Womanist Midrash. That was the first thing I ever read um, of yours, the work that you've done there. And the, the section on Hagar just blew my mind open. And um, I that's a text that I go to if I'm ever preaching on anything that relates to that portion of the Hebrew Bible. I always make sure I pull out Womanist Midrash <laughs> to hear what you have to say. Um, well, welcome. And thank you for that extended introduction. I would love to just talk briefly with you about your journey to this work um, as a biblical scholar, your journey to this work. We rarely have biblical scholars as our speakers. And so we're, I'm very excited because that's my passion. But I want to hear about your journey to this work and the particular lens you take. Um, a lot of the same things that I've been reading about do involve women. Um, and so we're excited about that. Well, I think that Black folk who are raised in Christian homes um, are steeped in scripture in such a way that it is a part of our formational identity, regardless of what we choose to do with it. So the stories of the text were very familiar. And I also say that I think Black folk are, are people of the Hebrew Bible plus Jesus, because the stories that we hear uh, in Sunday school and vacation Bible school and church camp and the stories from which the songs are based, are primarily Hebrew Bible, but with the stories of Jesus woven in. So that was my uh, comfort, comfort uh, setting in terms of the biblical text. I found myself in a church where I discovered that I had a set of spiritual gifts to contribute to the good of the body, and that initially I uh, understood them as teaching and later understood as teaching and preaching and then pastoring would be added on to that. And in that process, I knew that I needed to go to uh, seminary. And so I chose Howard University School of Divinity. And it was really there uh, in my Hebrew Bible class with the now late Gene Rice that I just fell in love with the text all over again because I loved how he taught and I studied Hebrew with him. And it just became very readily apparent that this is what I was going to do uh, with the bulk of the rest of my life. Mm, yes, yes. Thank you for that. Um, do you mind sharing a little bit about the journey when you talk about the church of your youth? And I'm assuming it's African Methodist Episcopal or was it something else? Um, we went through a number of churches. I was baptized AME. Okay. And so there was some returning when I was later ordained AME Zion, a different church, but a very similar tradition. But in between, we were at a non-denominational church for youth group. Um, so it was really a variety. I was in Catholic high school. Um, so I was exposed to a broad swath of Christianity as a younger person. Yeah, yeah. Good. I was just curious. I'm always interested in the in the many um well, people who work in ecumenical spaces or have had more of an ecumenical experience, and you are ordained in the Episcopal tradition, though. Yes, I'm yes. in the Episcopal yes. space. Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> Good. Um, so in terms of the curation of Womanist Midrash and the lectionaries, I have to say that I did not grow up with a lectionary. I'm, I grew up in a Black Baptist church. I never heard of a lectionary uh, until maybe... I was in my 20s and I went to seminary in 2016. I was 27. That might have been the first time that I actually looked at a lectionary. I just didn't grow up with it. I didn't understand the concept. Um, and so I would love for you to talk about, particularly um, that now that we have released Year W and Year A, but Year W is kind of standalone. Um, can you talk about the curation of that and and the importance of having these particular lectionary uh, subsets in conversation with the revised common lectionary, which is what most churches who use a lectionary use. So I want to start by saying that what is common knowledge or common understanding about how Christianity works in the United States or in the West is often wrong, right? Protestants are loud. That's my language for talking about Protestants. Um, as an Episcopalian, uh, there's some people who will classify, classify us as Protestants. I'm not one of those. Some understand us as Anglo-Catholic, which is how I lean. 
Uh, some say we're neither fish nor fowl, and sometimes I'll take that as well. And so I bring this up to say that um, the face of American Christianity is often Protestantism, but that is the minority tradition uh, in the United States and in the world. There are over 1 billion Roman Catholics. And so all by themselves, they're the religious majority, the Christian majority. Add to them all of the Anglicans, uh, uh, Orthodox, Episcopalians, the Methodists, the Lutherans, and the Presbyterians, and the majority of Christians on the planet and in this country hear the scripture preached through a lectionary. Um, Protestant, non-denominational, independent, standalone, uh, these congregations tend not to. Some American Baptists do use a lectionary, some UCC, but that, that seems to be dependent on the preference of the pastor. So the reality is the majority of Christendom is experiencing the text through uh, the Roman Catholic lectionary, uh, the Orthodox lectionary, or the Revised Common Lectionary, which tends to cover everyone else. So the curation of this particular lectionary was in response to RCL in one particular week having texts that I just simply did not feel like preaching. Now, I've never felt myself limited to RCL. I will preach off lectionary uh, in a minute. But it just occurred to me that these texts are so androcentric. The Bible is androcentric. I talk about that in Daughters of Miriam and in Womanist Midrash. But it is not as androcentric as it is made out to be in the lectionary. And so I thought that we could organize a lectionary around texts with women in them explicitly, and sometimes with women behind the scenes in expressions like the people, the Israelites, et cetera. So this lectionary uh, curated an entirely new selection of texts for every Sunday of the year. And because I am an Episcopal priest for the great, uh, for the principal feasts of our year, things like uh, Pentecost and Ascension and the baptism of Jesus, all of Epiphany, all of the, the special feasts that we observe, uh, the weekly services for Holy Week and the weekly services for Lent. And I threw in uh, two of my favorite saints, the ever-blessed Virgin Mary and Mary Magdalene. So it covers our entire liturgical year uh, with four readings for uh, each Sunday in most days, uh, a first lesson generally from the Hebrew Bible. Second lesson is a psalm or another song piece, uh, canticle. Uh, then a New Testament selection that's not from the gospel because the last lesson is from the gospel. So choosing new texts that fit each Sunday, but fit each Sunday within the shape of the calendrical year, the Christian calendrical year, so that they were suited for Advent and then Christmas tide and then Epiphany went season after Pentecost, Easter tide, season after Pentecost, and so forth. Yes. I've, that's so fascinating to me. And, you know, I, I started getting more familiar with the lectionary when I was going through the ordination process for the United Church of Christ. And um, so, so one of the things that I've always struggled with is the seasons. And so I'm looking at this book and saying, okay, this is helping me shape the seasons differently. And I always felt particularly a disconnect in Advent with a lot of the scriptures that I was seeing in the Revised Common Lectionary. Sometimes I was feeling them, other times um, I, I really wasn't. Also, what I noticed over the course of just my preaching life right now I didn't realize how much of the stuff that I really loved was left out of the Revised Common Lectionary. Now, I know you you make a statement in the intro of these books that you couldn't include everything. No lectionary can include everything. But did you see a trend of things that were left out, particularly as they relate to women? I'm thinking about Lot's wife and some other characters that are left out of the Revised Common Lectionary. Well, in spite of this project being prompted by a frustrating occur. Uh, interaction with the RCL on particular day, this was not a reactionary project. So I was not looking at what was in RCL. Um, so I shaped this essentially de novo. Yeah, what, can you say more about that? <laughs> so I, so I, I pulled it together uh, in isolation, not looking at, well, what are they doing for the season of Advent? What do I wanna do? Uh, so the first thing I did was, uh, use a, a, a Boolean search to 
generate a list of texts that had women uh, in them by uh, explicit names, titles, descriptions, and things. And from those texts, as I started at a season, you know, I gave myself a blurb about what this season does and what it's supposed to do. So for Advent, it is to prepare us for the return of Christ while remembering his first Advent, the first time he came. So I looked at texts that had to do with telling that story in a particular way. And once um, I got a Hebrew Bible text, you know, then I built on, on the latter. So for year W, what I chose to do was focus on the, uh, the stories of Annunciation. So that's why the year W begins with Hagar. So Hagar is the first person to receive Annunciation from God. Uh, mm -hmm. Sarah and Abraham also receive one. Um, Hannah receives one and Samson's mother receives one. Well, there's four weeks in Advent. So there you are, four stories of Advent, of this, this thing that God does in the scriptures, the way that the Israelites told stories that uh, God prepares special babies for special seasons. So I use that as my entree. Uh, in, the, in year A, which is the first of the three-year cycle, and year A goes through the Gospel of Matthew, year B will be Mark, Year C will be Luke, and there's John sprinkled throughout. Um, I started with uh, Genesis 1-1. That is something that happens sometimes in the RCL, simply as, as a starting place to, you know, this is the first year of a new lectionary cycle. Let's sort of start on the first page of the Bible. But unlike what happens in uh, lessons that are designed by uh, previous lectionary makers, I take that lesson through into the creation of woman and man, right? So uh, rather than stop with, with creatures and skies and stars, uh, you know, one of the practices of the selectionary is get the women on the page. So women come up relatively early in Genesis. So if you're doing the creation narrative, you just extend it. Mm -hmm. Similarly, when I was doing uh, the Great Vigil of Easter, which is a time where we read a lot of scripture back to back telling sort of a broad story of salvation. When I used the Exodus text about crossing the Red Sea, I made sure my verses went down and included the prophet Miriam. Uh, in the RCL, they do not do uh, Miriam. I also replaced all of the other texts and I used uh, women who uh, were deliverers or had their own stories of salvation, like Deborah delivering the nation, uh, like Judith delivering the nation. Um, so, uh, those were how I made the decisions, really uh, just starting with a fresh subset of biblical texts in which women were present or sometimes just behind the scenes. Yeah, that is, that is wonderful. And it's a text that um, we have a group here called Reading Between the Lines, and they go through the RCL every week and talk about it. But um, they have a peak, a new interest in going through year A or your W one year instead of using the RCL because they have felt like they have not gotten a fuller picture, a full enough picture of the text. And I think also uh, for people who, the very few Bible people we have at our church, for those people, they've gone through years A, B, and C so much that they're just, yeah. they're, they're hungry for some new material. So I think I'm going to send them your W to start with. Yes. <laughs> In fact, that's what I recommend that people use your W um, for this coming year, which will be year C. So the following year will be year A and they'll be in sequence. But lectionary fatigue is real. I remember uh, sitting uh, in a church with a pastor and not realizing that I had been with them now into a fourth year because they had preached through the whole lectionary and it was year A again. And when they started, it's like, oh, my God, this is the exact same sermon. And I realized they were going to preach the next three years, every sermon that I had heard the last three years. Maybe they're going to make some changes. But starting out, it was like, I know exactly where we are going with this. Oh, my God. Right. So there is lectionary fatigue for congregations. Uh, hopefully not too many priests and pastors are doing that. But I know some are. Mm -hmm. But also for pastors who are like, OK, my sec second time through this lect lectionary cycle with the same congregation, how am I going to freshen it up? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they may, OK, I'll preach only on the second text this whole time. Uh, but this is a, a clean break moving to a whole new set of texts. 
And it's pushing a different set of questions. When the characters aren't, you know, the men that God loves, the men who love God, for whom everything works out all right, um, how are we telling the gospel and how are we telling the story of God when it's women who are being used to make babies, uh, not always consensually, uh, when it's women who are marginalized in the text, when me getting a woman on the page means she's there for three words and then gone for the rest of the story. Uh, so it's it's not uh, simply, well, let's just switch to the women, but it means we're going to have to tell a different kind of story and we're going to have to be honest about a different kind of portrait of God. Uh, and we're going to have to do some work as, as preachers uh, to say, these things are our scriptures too. The fact that we've put them in the closet doesn't mean that they're not there. So let's bring it all out of the closet. Let's put it all on the table and let's talk about the portraits of God, the theologies at stake, what it was our ancient ancestors believed and left us with which to wrestle. Mm, yes, yes, yes. Well, we're looking forward to that and in, in particularly this this year, starting with Advent, really incorporating your W into our preaching program. Now, I just have a question that I'm, when you said some preachers were preaching the same thing, if there are four or five scriptures that are, uh, you know, recommended, couldn't you, do you always, I know some churches always only preach the gospel. Right. Um, so I, I get for those churches, but for other places that don't, you could technically have four different. Right. You, you could. <laughs> and even, I mean, and in theory, you could preach the gospel a different way, but it was just very clear. None of that was happening in the place where I was sitting. Uh, and yeah. some, some pastors wrestle with that. Uh, some uh, feel that they need to comment on all the texts together and how they are connected. And sometimes the RCL was not connecting texts well. There'd just be sort of like uh, almost uh, like word identification. Oh, here's a prophet. Here's a prophet. Let's just put these two texts together. Like, are they talking? What are they talking about? So, uh, yeah, some some lectionary pastors struggle with the perceived need to preach the gospel. And I, for to that, I say, you know, Jesus preached the gospel every day of his life, and he didn't use any of those texts that were not yet written. He preached the gospel using the Hebrew scriptures. You can too. Be like Jesus. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I'm, I'm an advocate for that. There's so much Bible to learn. I would hate to know somebody who'd never heard a sermon from Genesis or Exodus or, you know, some of the other important um, stories. So I have a question about womanist midrash, which was, which was my introduction to your work. Um, and you use the word midrash, and I'm always kind of struggling with how to explain that to people. Can you give me a, a, a nice brief definition for the, the folks listening? What is midrash, and why is that tradition so important? Particularly for, I, th I think about, you know, Protestants, but I'm in this Baptist setting um, where, you know, people have come with, have come from traditions where you weren't supposed to ask questions about the Bible or ask questions about the preacher. And so the idea of even having conversation about the Bible is taboo for so many folks. Can you talk about Midrash a little bit? So Midrash is the practice of Jewish exegesis. It is a formal and codified practice. And uh, it's one of the topics that I studied when I did my PhD in Hebrew Bible and I did a focus on uh, rabbinic literature and rabbinic scholarship. So Midrash is a, is a technical uh, term. It's, it's Jewish exegesis, Jewish biblical interpretation. And it exists at several levels. So there's the classical Midrash, which is the collections of scholars uh, writing in the first few centuries, uh, interpreting uh, various passages of scripture. It's ongoing biblical interpretation, uh, ongoing Jewish biblical interpretation, and to some degree, contemporary biblical interpretation in that stream of tradition. And Midrash is characterized by a uh, close reading of the text in Hebrew and asking those questions and having those conversations based on uh, the, the original language of the text. Um, and what the rabbis did often was they would give a character name if they didn't have a name, including women. So they gave a name to David's mother. They gave a name to Samson's mother. Um, and they would fill out the gaps in the story. 
And so what happens is that people know Midrash as rewritten Bible. Oh, let me write an alternate ending. Or uh, Jonah is stuck under this tree at the end of the book. What happens next? Let me write the next chapter. That is part of Midrash. But uh, I would encourage Christians to not adopt uh, that language or that practice without having actually studied Jewish rabbinic Midrash because uh, Christians have a, a bad habit of uh, taking the sacred things of others uh, without thought or consideration. So when I say Midrash, I'm talking about it being in conversation and in the tradition of classical Jewish uh, rabbinic biblical interpretation. Yes. Yes. I, I agree. Thank you for that. Um, hope folks are listening or listening to that. And also I think Christians have a tendency to be always pointing to Jesus, some Christians, right? And so then they they run that risk as well when they're interpreting or having these conversations. So when we talk about womanish or womanism, I know we had some conversation about the fact that you were a biblical scholar, not a theologian, and uh, can you can you give more information about that? So when you labeled your book "Woman Womanish Theology," I'm mean, sorry, "Womanist um, Womanish Midrash," you were looking at more of the umbrella, right, of womanism. Am yeah. I correct? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so womanism is an intellectual proposition. It's a uh, it's a set of, of perspectives mm -hmm. that shape practices uh, initially articulated by Alice Walker in a couple of different ways. Um, and so womanism exists uh, in the same way that feminism is. And uh, feminism is not reduced to theology. There's, uh, you know, feminist politics and feminist authors. And uh, it's, it's just a larger proposition. People tend to be familiar with womanism in the religious academy through theology because that's where it came, that's the door it came in. It came in with uh, the Reverend Dr. Katie Geneva Cannon of Blessed Memory. And then she was in conversation uh, with people like Cheryl Kirk Dugan and Kelly Brown Douglas and Renita Weens, who is a biblical scholar. But the, the really the very first times that we saw uh, womanism used to engage uh, the Bible uh, was by theologians, uh, Dolores Williams, for example. So uh, people have reached womanism uh, to theology, and there's womanist ethics and womanist pastoral care. Um, so womanist really is an, an adjective uh, that describes uh, womanist and womanish ways of doing whatever the discipline is. And in my case, that's biblical studies. Mm -hmm. When I was reading uh, through parts of Womanish Midrash, I felt like I was seeing women of color, Black women on the page, mm -hmm. as opposed to just women. Mm -hmm. And I'm asking, maybe I'm just making this up because I know a little bit about you know the background, but can you talk a little bit about the lens um, and what would separate this work from feminist, the, feminist, a feminist biblical scholar, right? There's a lens that I'm trying to, I'm trying to articulate that I can't, I, I see it on the paper. Um, can you expound a little bit on that? So womanism is rooted in the experience and identity of black women. And so uh, game recognize game, right? So we see each other uh, and we hear each other uh, when we hear our language being used, when we hear our vernacular being used. Um, and so it's recognizable. Obviously, uh, the people of the ancient Afro-Asiatic world are Afro-Asiatic. So we are already talking about black and brown folk. So when I write a narrative like uh, Ahinoam, uh, the mother of Nikal uh, and Merav, Saul's daughters, comforting her child uh, by doing what black woman, women have done for 5,000 years, braiding and grooming her hair, um, you know, with her sitting between her thighs. I don't know that there's a black woman or girl who hasn't had that experience of being held in mother, grandmother, aunties, or even sister friend's thighs. Uh, and sometimes your boyfriend's thighs while he's taking your braids out. 
or taking your weave out, right? Like that experience of having your hair groomed as part of a gesture of comfort, um, you know, that's black folk all day. But it's also appropriate to the genre because Afro-Asiatic people are going to have denser, curler, curlier, coilier hair. Right. Yeah, yeah. I definitely felt that when I was reading through, um, especially like I mentioned before, the, the Hagar section. Um, and one of the things you actually said in the Hagar section, I had never heard before, but you said her name, I guess, translates to foreigner. Yes. And I so, never, oh my God. Yeah, and so one of the, so a lot of my work, and, and maybe this is how we're gonna get here in this conversation, uh, my approach to biblical studies, like my approach to Midrash, is rooted in the language. And so what that book, Woman is Midrash, is trying to do is to help people who don't know biblical languages to be able to read the biblical text almost as closely as I do. And for me to, to turn the page for them and show them what's under the surface uh, if you know the rudiments of the language. And so the word for the in Hebrew is ha, right? You know, the clock, ha clock, the girl, ha girl. I mean, so you just put that prefix ha in front of anything. And the word gar uh, comes from gur, which is to be a, a foreigner, to the sojourner, the sojourner within your gates. And so, and it's not even the feminine form, uh, like, oh, that foreign lady, she immigrated. It's not even that which might be polite. And so I argue that it's used as a, an epithet. Tell that foreign one, go get a bucket of water. You know, foreigner, come here. Like it's not, it's not even a name, right? And so once we know what that is grammatically and we recognize that it's Hebrew and the story is telling us that she's an Egyptian woman, then we have to say, there's no, no way in heck uh, um, <laughs> there's no way in heck that uh, her Egyptian mama named her foreign in Hebrew. Like even even if her Egyptian mama had got with with a Hebrew man and they had a baby across cultures, because that happens, that's not what they're going to name their child. Mm. Well, it, when you said that, that really opened up another can of worms for me, not even just related to Hagar, right? But related to all of the names, particularly right. in the Hebrew Bible. Yeah. <laughs> like how many of the names that we're saying are actually, um, you know, a noun for something or, I mean, yeah. I'm. <laughs> sure. Um, in, uh in the second half of uh, Women is Midrash, I talk about royal women. And uh, Zerua, who is the mother of, mm, I'm gonna say, Jeroboam, who is charged with having divided the, the kingdom of Israel into two pieces, but it's more complicated than that because God really divided the kingdom. But his mother's name, and I address that there, um, it's, it's a word for, disease, which is likely not her name. But what they're saying is a commentary on this man that they hold responsible for the downhold, downfall of the nation. So they're saying, you know, he's the son of a diseased woman. Um, you know, it's like saying he's a SOB. Um, and so it's not, that's not her name either. And what is likely is there are names that you can reconstruct from that. Uh, and it's, it's like somebody making fun of you because of your name, taking a part of your name and then using it to be mean. Um, so. Oh my gosh. And that, that colors the way we preach the text. Those of us who, you know, preach, you know, um, that colors the way we, we interpret, but also the way we deliver the message to other people to know that the name is not just a name, but there's a connotation um, I, it's hard to go forward preaching without acknowledging that. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's why my intro course is set up as, uh, introduction to interpreting the Hebrew Bible in context. And so the, the mantra is content and context. Uh, you have to know what the text says and you can't know it in English, uh, in the same way as you can in Hebrew. You have to know what it says, and you have to know what it meant in its context. And then you can talk about what it means in your context 
building a bridge between the two. And sometimes you may want to uh, blow up the bridge and have a disjunction, right? You know, what this text meant was that when they went to war uh, and they saw women, uh, they took them home and kept them. Okay, that's exactly what that meant in that context. But however, in this context, what we're going to do is look at the way in which war is violent against women, whether it's rapine or whether it's economic violence. And so now we're going to talk about uh, violent outcomes in war and after war, rather than saying, well, the Bible says just pick up a girl, right? So mm -hmm. we can absolutely disrupt the context, but you have to know a context in order to disrupt it. Mm, yes, yes. And when you're thinking about sharing this, your work um, with lay people, how do we have these conversations, right? Because I mean, I'm very fascinated because I'm, uh, you know, I like to read and I, I love this stuff. I love biblical scholarship. Um, but when I'm trying to help lay people read the text, do you have any tips? Do you have any suggestions or, or for people who want to read it on their own and want to have a deeper understanding? Like I said earlier, the people are hungry for some new some new lenses to help interpret, particularly because of the world we're living in. They're no longer taking what was given to them in Sunday school 50 years ago or however long ago. Right. Do you have any tips for people who are wanting to read the Bible differently? I would say read it with, with a companion in hand. And so that's what Womanist Midrash is. It's a companion to reading the scriptures. And I also invite uh, lay folk, any folk, to read the lectionary as a devotional term, as a devotional tool. So whether your pastor or priest is going to use it at all, um, starting with that uh, first Sunday of Advent, which is right after Thanksgiving, use those lessons. There's four lessons each day. Go through those four lessons in a, in a week, however you want to break them up. There's commentary in there on what's happening in the text in terms of why I translate the way I do. Um, and there's some uh, focusing commentary if someone were going to preach that's also useful for someone to study and reflect on. So that becomes a week's worth of devotion and you have one every week of the year. Um, so read that in conversation with your Bible and look at the differences of translation. Um, so uh, lay folk can absolutely uh, read more deeply and more thoughtfully if they have the right kind of companion and if they have the space around them where they can ask questions and have these conversations. Yeah, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, we're coming to the end of our time here, but I, I did want to remind all of our listeners that Dr. Gaffney will be with us um, October 16th and 17th, and you will be teaching two plenaries or leading two plenaries. Plenary one is translating women back into scripture for hashtag women's, uh, women's lectionary. And then plenary two is reading women in scripture for preaching, study, and devotion. So if you come to those sessions, you'll get to get a little bit more about how we can all read the Bible um, more intentionally with uh, greater depth. Um, and also you'll be preaching on the 17th and we'll have a talk back. So that is something that we're very much looking forward to. And for those of us who are interested, I am hosting a couple of sessions where we'll be reading some select blogs that you've written and some essays and a few excerpts from some of your books. So um, please contact me if you would love to join those sessions. Dr. Gaffney, is there anything final that you would love to share with us about your work, about the importance, especially in this time period in our country, in our world? There's so much economic injustice, so much racial suffering. Mm -hmm. um, is there a way that your work can help people through that? I think it's important to take seriously that our scriptures are a complex body of literatures not a single book, not a single thing. And to be very wary of people who make universalist claims about them. That some of what we're seeing in our culture, whether it's opposition to mask wearing, uh, whether it's uh, in uh, opposition to science in the classroom, you know, people not wanting to, to teach biology and evolution, opposition to history being taught and printed in textbooks. Let's not talk about slavery, it's embarrassing. There's underneath all of those, there's a kind of fundamentalism 
that says, you know, it's just me and Jesus. All that matters is what I believe. And because this is what I believe, I get to say and do these things uh, that affect you. And I'm basing what I believe on uh, reading all of these texts without context, without nuance, and just making some declarations. And you can't argue with me because it's faith and it's Jesus. And so I want people to have a more rich and nuanced understanding of the diversity of literature in scripture, of the different ways uh, our spiritual ancestors uh, left things behind us, uh, things for us to accept, sometimes things for us to disregard, sometimes things for us to reinterpret. Um, but again, to be like Jesus who says, you have seen it was written, but I say unto you. Uh, and so Jesus models for us that even when we understand well, we have to flip the script when we move into a new era. And so the ability to do that uh, rests in knowing the text and their context well and having a subtle, flexible, and nuanced understanding of scripture and literature. Yeah, yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and I hope that this empowers all of us to be able to, to dive deeper. Um, and, and for the sake of what this whole podcast is about, justice, sacred justice. So Dr. Gaffney, we thank you so much for joining us on the podcast, introducing us to who you are and giving us a little bit so we'll be ready for you in October. Um, for those of you who are listening, feel free to email me. My email is mmcclain at myersparkbaptist.org for questions or if you need some help with finding the books, I can point you in the right direction to our wonderful book partners here in Charlotte. All right, everybody, take care. Thank you. Thank bye bye you. now. Friends, that was our episode this week. As always, please email your questions and your suggestions to Reverend Mia McLean at mmcclain at myersparkbaptist.org. Until next time, take care. This is Sacred Justice.